speak falsely and call someone a man who is uh, a, a, a woman and deny the nature of reality, I don't have any just good justification for that. Lie number two. Lie number two is that transitioning leads to wholeness, right? And this is referred to uh, kind of as the harm argument. This is, this is the argument against traditional views like you and I might hold. It's the harm argument. And the harm argument goes this way. If you don't affirm some, someone's gender identity, they're going to experience a level of rejection and discrimination and low self-esteem, which then is going to lead them to self-harm even suicide. And so, therefore, in the interest of their well-being, what do you do? You must affirm their gender identity. In fact, Aaron and I just watched a video yesterday of a mom uh, describing what happened uh, in a school district in Los Angeles when her daughter started to identify as a male. And the school got involved, and, uh, and, and this was part of the argument for eventually taking the daughter out of the home at 16 years of age and putting her into child protective services. Because if we didn't do this, then she's going to self-harm. And of course, for a, a mom who's going through this situation, parents who are going through the situation, that's the last thing you want to hear. And then it's used as leverage to do what? To take the kid out of the home and help them with their transition. But what we see is the data does not show that transition leads to wholeness. In fact, here's what the data shows. 41% uh, of transgenders will attempt suicide. Compare this to the, 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 the attempted suicide uh, rate of the general population, just 4.6%. Okay. Now, some people will say, well, that's because of discrimination. Well, if, you, you make, if you make that claim, you're going to have to back that up with data. In fact, what we see when you look at other issues that are in the acronym LGBTQ, right, when it came to, you, you had the same argument being made about the gay lifestyle. There are higher rates uh, of, uh, you know, anxiety or depression or suicide. All of this was because of discrimination. Well, we have plenty of evidence, evidence of, uh, of, uh, of gay men and women struggling with those same higher rates of anxiety, depression, suicide in very gay-friendly, affirming, and accepting societies like New Zealand or Great Britain or the Netherlands where same-sex marriage was uh, uh, ruled legal back in 2001. And in the same way, the data is showing that it's not, you, you, have, uh, tr you have gender, transgender affirming cultures like Sweden where you ha see these same rates. And so, uh, you have 19% people who have, and the, okay, so this is actually, this, this stat has to do with people who go through sex reassignment surgery. That, it, actually, that's outdated language. It's now gender affirming uh, surgery, right? So change the language, change the views. But people who have sex assign, reassignment surgery are still 19 times more likely to die of suicide than the general population, okay? So it's just assume that transitioning is going to lead to the wholeness that they desire, but we don't have actual data. In fact, here's what the data shows. Children with gender dysphoria, 80 to 95% will naturally grow out of it. It'll come, they'll, they'll go into it, and then they'll come out of it, and they'll eventually, 80 to 95% will eventually identify with their bodily sex if we completely leave them alone and just let them develop naturally. So why would we think the best course of action is to take that young person struggling with gender dysphoria and then get them on a path to transition? Uh, you have testimonies. In fact, here's some, re I'm gonna give you, we're going to give you some homework uh, to do, because we all, need to, we all need to get up to speed on this issue. It is a central issue for our young people, okay? And uh, uh, go onto YouTube and either do a search for detransition or detransitioning or transgender regret. And what you'll begin to see are stories that you won't see on, in mainstream media outlets, 
of many, many young men and women who are publicly speaking out about their regret, who have gone through the transition and are transitioning back. In fact, one of them who's actually a believer is a guy named Walt Heyer. You can go to his website, Walt Heyer, it's H-E-Y-E-R, and he's got testimonies on it. He's got his own testimony. This is a picture of Walt before as a, a man. He transitions to a trans woman, and then he transitioned back, and now he's going around speaking about this issue, courageously speaking out. And of course, when you look at how he's treated online, I mean, he just gets ripped apart, right? But he's courageous enough to speak the truth. And he talks about how his own transition came back to haunt him. Here's what he says. He says, the shame of being so narcissistic and self-absorbed as a transgender female and knowing I had hurt the ones I loved resulted in deep depression and regret. I started to consider suicide. That's what I mean when I say my once successful transition turned on me. I discovered much too late that gender change surgery was not a medical necessity at all. I can admit that transition was the biggest mistake of my life. Because what you'll find, a lot of uh, uh, individuals who go through that uh, sex reassignment surgery, the initial response is a feeling of maybe happiness or con some contentment. But it doesn't last. It doesn't last. And so this is another lie of our culture, that transitioning leads to wholeness. I think a third lie that we want to highlight um, that we have to guard our own minds against and our kids <laughs> against is that the lie that differences are bad. Uh, the culture says that if we acknowledge fundamental differences between men and women, that somehow that means that we are unequal in value. And it's, if we acknowledge this difference, it's almost that if, as if we are admitting that one is more valuable than the other. So the question, are men and women different, is something we need to be able to answer and we need our kids to be able to answer. Because if we don't answer this question correctly, it will actually bring about harm. So let's take an example that I'm sure all of you have heard from the University of Pennsylvania, the swimmer uh, Leah Thomas. Um, in the Sports Illustrated article about Thomas, it said that Thomas is a first year swimmer from Penn State and is on the women's team after spending three seasons competing on the men's team. And then, uh, was it Will Thomas? Will yeah, Thomas. Will Thomas transitions to Leah Thomas. The next year then joins the women's team and, quote, Thomas throttled the competition. He set pool and school and Ivy League records in route of becoming the nation's most powerful female collegiate swimmer. Are there differences between men and women? It's self-evident. I mean, look at these pictures. These, this is a picture of two male and two female swimmers. Is there any question that the male swimmers have a physical advantage over female swimmers? Just looking at the picture, is there really any question? The second picture is Leah Thomas on the podium just a couple weeks ago with the championship trophy. And the two women that finished behind Leah, looking at this picture, you, you tell me, who gets hurt by denying the differences between men and women? Who gets hurt? And this last picture, again, just so self-evident as Leah jumps off the starting block along the other female swimmers. Again, the, the physical advantage that the male body has in physical competition over women is obvious. But here's the question. Does the difference mean unequal in value? Does it follow that men and women are unequal in value. Because if we don't follow this kind, because we don't actually follow this kind of reasoning in other areas. So let me give you a few examples. 
Here's a picture um, from a Sports Illustrated a while ago that had the five, some of the most famous athletes of all time. Here are some of those five famous athletes. A lot of us can probably name them. Um, Wayne Gretzky of hockey, Muhammad Ali of boxing, Babe Ruth, baseball, Michael Jordan basketball, Tiger Woods, golf. Now, because these men were were very capable and excelled in different sports, were they somehow inferior because of the sports they played? No, we can look at them and say, wow, they are all really good at what they were really good at. So we don't do this, actually, in in a lot of different areas. I mean, even think about the topic of food. If you've had the chance to experience food in other cultures and places... We don't just dismiss it as inferior simply because they're different. We can appreciate that different doesn't mean inferior, that different doesn't mean unequal in value. But oftentimes, I think we just need to admit and talk about openly, our culture places a higher value on masculine traits. And so it's often communicated, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly, that men are superior to women. Let me give you an example. What does our American culture value success in more than any other area? Well, I would argue career success and athletic success are at least two of the highest, if not the highest. We already talked about athletic success. I mean... If athletic success is one of the highest ways you can succeed, obviously the cards are stacked against women. What about career success? Well, we know that women make different choices when it comes to career, especially when women get into the childbearing phase of life. We make different choices. Sometimes we decide to take time off for a little while and go back. Sometimes we leave the career altogether and decide to raise children at home. So again, if career success is the best kind of success and women typically choose to have maybe a more balanced life, that maybe career isn't all that all that's valuable, well then you could see how the cards would be stacked against women if the culture thinks that career success is one of the best kinds of success. And has that trickled into the church? Does the church value the different choices that women might make? And I think this is obvious. I mean, I think it's obvious that as women, we, we make different choices. And, and that men tend towards um, work success, career success, in general, more than women. That's why you never really hear a joke about a woman being a a workaholic. Women just intuitively have a more balance of life, of, of wanting relationships, being at home, cultivating family. And, and so these differences are just what we see. And so these ideas of what we hold up as successful and good and right and bad, we have to think about about them because ideas have consequences. And bad ideas, of course, have victims. I think that picture from the swim podium shows that quite well. Slide. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) It's much more powerful when there's a slide. (laughs) Say that again, honey. (laughs) Ideas have consequences, and bad ideas have victims. So we were going to pause here and do some questions. We do want to get into this topic of the differences between men and women, God's design and all of that. But we'll pause maybe just for five minutes or so, do a few, and then we will do some questions at the end as well. But is is there any questions at this point? Michelle's got a mic. She can bring that around. We've we've just... You know, we just started. We've got some, uh, we, we're going to talk about some more practical things, but we wanted to just give a time, like, to digest a little bit about what we've talked about so far. So who's going to ask the first question? All right, let's skip to the second one. Uh, let's jump right to the second one. Yes, there we go. It's 
So a lot of the re- is this on? Okay. So a lot of the reason I feel like we're being overwhelmed by this <clears throat> with corporations, all of society is the cancel culture, right? If you don't embrace it, they come after you. So when you live or work in a woke corporation, do you have any advice for us as we try to not get drowned out in that sea of culture? Yeah, this is a really good question. Did you guys all hear that question? Okay. This is a question that the church really needs to wrestle with. Uh, because we are going to say, hey, look, there is nothing. Uh, it's not an option for us to compromise biblical views, right? No matter what the issue comes to, we cannot compromise biblical views. In fact, this is one of my, uh, one of our, uh, uh, kind of our ending practical points. So what we have to do instead is we have to prepare for the social costs of following Jesus. Now, I know that's easy to say, uh, but, but so I think it's going to start with us mentally preparing preparing that there may come a time, and there has already come that time for people in our culture, right? Well, just recently in Loudoun County in Virginia, uh, a teacher who, would not, who, who said he would not use the personal pronouns, preferred pronouns of a student, was then, fi- you know, was, was let go, and now there, it's been litigated, I think it's being litigated, and he's been reinstated or whatever, but, but he, there's somebody who's truly facing cancel culture, right? You get, you're, you're canceled, and canceled doesn't mean there's just constant natural consequences for your actions. I mean, we go after you, and we try to, you know, destroy your life, career, reputation, whatever. This is a reality that we're going to have to face, and I, so I think churches have to have this conversation, because uh, there are going to be people who are in those kind of situations where their job is under threat, and this is where I think the church is going to have to figure out Okay, maybe we come up with something like a fund that we're going to help people in our body who struggle. You know what? And the rest of us are going to sacrifice where maybe we don't have that kind of situation, but we're going to develop a fund for people in our church that get canceled, right? That's the kind, I think that's the kind of practical thing we've got to, be, we, we, we've got to do. So on an individual level, we're going to have to count the costs. Okay, what's, what's the line? What do I think the biblical line is? Right. And, um, you know, at what point do I say I can no longer go further? I think a good principle is a principle by um, Rod Dreher. Well, it's not actually Rod Dreher's, but he wrote in his book, Live Not by Lies, citing uh, 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 Solzhenitsyn, (laughs) right, who, who said, live not by lies. I think it's a good principle, live not by lies. So if someone is asking me to sit to speak falsely, I can't do that. I can't knowingly speak falsely without proper justification. Like I think, hey, Nazis at my door, I'm hiding Jews. I think that's a justified instance of speaking falsely (laughs) to save their life. But speak falsely and call someone a man who is uh, a a, a woman and deny the nature of reality, I don't have any just good justification for that except to make life easier for myself. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if I have the justification for that. And we're going to have to figure out, and there, there's going to be, a, we've got to give each other some grace on this because there's going to be, there's got to be room for some different conscience on this, right? Um, in, in some of these issues, like how far can you go? I certainly don't think we can come to the point where we can accept a biological man is now a woman, all right? Uh, that I think clearly violates scripture. But the other stuff, it's, we're going to have to wrestle with it. We're going to have to give each other grace on this. And we're going to have to figure this out in our communities because this is where we're going to need churches to really support us. So Yeah, I, th- I was just going to say, I think it's um, the community is what I was thinking about because I think we have to start developing courage, realizing we live in a post-Christian culture. So we don't get to live comfortably as Christians, or at least we should have that mindset. If we live in a culture that's hostile to our faith, we should um, expect that we will not be comfortable and that we're going to have to have courage sometimes to say things or not just, sometimes even just not going along. 
And yeah, if you're living in a community of people who are with you and supporting you and you lose a job, how less scary is that than if you're alone? You know, yeah. and I just think about, you know, you think about the history of the church. You read the New Testament. All these letters Paul wrote are to churches who are living in hostile cultures to Christianity. And we can read those letters and that can help us to build courage to do what's right um, in these different situations. Of course, it was a different time and place, but some of the principles are exactly the same. And um, so, yeah, I think big time is community. We need it more now than ever. We need community. Yeah, and let me tag on to that. We can't just critique culture. We should be building culture. Mm -hmm. So here's a thought. We should be f figuring out who in our churches are entrepreneurial and have a passion for that. Let's find our young people who want to be entrepreneurs and help them build businesses so that when a brother or sister in Christ loses their job, but you know what? I've got a business I'm, I'm running here, and I, you know what? I'm going to hire you and, and help you out. And that's how, I mean, that's just real practical ways that we can, we can help each other in this. Yeah. Tag teaming on the comment tag teaming on the comment of practical. Um, I really liked your example in the beginning of how you taught your kids to surf. Um, but at the same token, there was a time of protection, but then there was a time of preparation. Can you give some real practical examples for all the parents and grandparents in here of how they need to now start thinking about the practical, how to go from protection mm -hmm. to practical as they prepare kids really young. I mean, mm -hmm. when you see the kindergarten, some kids are gonna face this even in their kindergarten years. What are the conversations that need to start happening at home? Can, can we hit pause on that? Because uh, that's our very next slide. <laughs> so we'll get into very practical things. So, that we, just so your question's so important. We have a, a bunch of slide, a bunch of material to go through on that. So thank you. Maybe we should. Oh yeah, and should we, we just dive into? Well, it? is there any any one dying to ask one more question? Well, let's do one more question, if we've got one. If not, we'll we'll move on. Good. Okay. One more. Thirty minutes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. In your own community, give you the most pushback. Say it again. In your own community, what group of people give you the most pushback? Hmm. <laughs> Aaron. Aaron <laughs> she's always critiquing me. No. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, in, it's in the church and it's outside of the church. Um, you, I'm, you know what I just thought about was two weeks ago. Uh, because my, my oh, thought was yeah. it, it's, it's young people. Yeah. And I'm not singling out young people to pick on them. I'm just saying it's young people that mm -hmm. I, we hear the most pushback. And yeah. just spoke at a middle school conference. Yeah, I was in Arkansas, and um, we're going to get to some of the things I was talking to these medical, middle school students about. But even just the illustration, I talked about the swimming talk, and I talked to them about the differences between the male body and the female body. And I wasn't just talking about genitals. I was talking about the whole makeup of the body and how it's different. And those girls got so mad at me. And a couple of the girls just had to walk out. They just couldn't even come talk to me. But some of them did. And, um, and so just even, you know, in the church, these kids growing up in the church and hearing that it's okay to say that the male body is different than the female body and that the male body is physically stronger was so upsetting to these girls. And so... It's in the church, you know, it's, it's seeped into the church. And especially, you know, if we're not preparing our young people to think carefully about these things, they get swept up in this ocean. And then you say something as to, to a lot of us as simple as that there's a difference between male and female. And that is so offensive to them in a real way. They were really offended. And so um, anyway, uh, yeah, well, and maybe... I, I Maybe that'll launch good into. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, I, I so I would say it's young people. I was speaking at a camp uh, last year, and it's, uh, it was it, with Impact 360, which is a solid organization, do wonderful work. If you've got a high schooler, send them to Impact 360. Uh, their immersion camp is a two-week camp. But even in that camp, 
Uh, I, 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 was do, I was mentioning Ellen Page, who transitioned to Elliot Page, and uh, my, my particular view is that we, it's actually the more loving thing uh, to not use people's preferred pronouns. Now, I have a whole argument for that. I'm open to people having differing views on that, but I've got reasons why I hold that view, because I think part of loving requires bearing witness to the truth. And so, anyway, I didn't use per, uh, preferred pronouns in reference to Elliot. And I had students who came up to me. They were pretty ticked at me. And so, you know, I was gracious with them and reasoned with them. But I, that, the, it's, it's young people because this is what they're soaking in. Mm -hmm. So, what are the practical things that we need to do? Aaron? <laughs> well, I think we need to start with um, just this idea of teaching our kids Got a worldview that we look at these topics not as little topics, but we think about teaching our kids an entire worldview, a Christian worldview. Which, what is worldview? It's just the picture of reality. And so, we do big picture stuff with our kids so that when these issues come up, they have a foundation and understand the big worldview. And what Christianity says about all kinds of areas of life and how Christianity matches up with reality. And so we start with um, two, vital, two vital questions that any worldview um, addresses. And that's going to help give an accurate picture of reality and therefore help us to flourish, right? So the first one is origin. Where did we come from? And then that leads us to identity who we are, what we are. And I, I think a, a illustration that you could say to your kids, something that we all understand, is if we think about something like a, a washing machine. This is similar to the one we have at home. Now, this is a certain type of washing machine. It's a clothing washing machine, right? So we put our clothes in there, we use it the way it's supposed to, and it works. It cleans our clothes. Now, if I put my dishes in there, it would break down. My dishes would break down. The machine would break down. And vice versa, if we put our clothes in the dishwashing machine, it wouldn't work. Now, how do we know how to operate a washing machine? Well, we look at the manual. We look to the person who designed the machine and say, okay, how does this thing work? What is it supposed to do? How does it flourish? And so, to answer what something is, or what something is, tells you what it is for and how it should function. And so, how do we know what the designer of human beings says? Well, we have two ways of discovering this. One is God's word, and the other one is God's world. And this is what we can talk, both of these areas, we can talk through with our kids and help them to develop a whole world view about our origin and our identity and what they're rooted in. So we'll go first to God's word, Genesis 1. What do we learn about the origin and identity of human beings? Well, Genesis 1 starts with God creates. God's the creator. Then what else do we learn? God creates humanity. Then we learn God creates humanity in his image. What does that mean? And then we learn that God creates humanity in his image as male and female. That both bear his image. What does that mean? What does that look like? And then what do we learn? Fast forward to Genesis 1.31. God saw, saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The way we are designed, male-bodied, female-bodied, God says, this is good. Like, I, w I want you to see what, what Aaron has talked about here. It's a framing. So this is why worldview teaching is absolutely essential because the, 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 the thing that makes sense of our view of Genesis 1 is origin and identity. And let me say this, you have to do more than just say the what. All we're doing right now is going through some of the what's. You also, for young people, have to get to the why as well. 
So it's not enough to simply say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you believe in God? Oh, good. Glad you believe in God. Let's move on. No. Why do you believe in God? In fact, we as parents and grandparents and leaders, we should be the first ones asking the kids why they believe something. (laughs) Because when you ask the why question, you'll discover, number one, whether they truly believe it, and number two, if their belief is actually very strong. Because you can say, oh, I believe in God and have no reasons for it. And then when you come along, when someone comes along and challenges that, guess what? That f- belief falls to the wayside. So I can ask my eight-year-old, hey, do you believe that God made males and females? Yes. But if I don't give them the why, then when they're 12 or 13 and their peers are questioning them and offering all these other ideas, and they can't explain beyond, well, because the Bible tells me so, then they're going to drop that idea. So we not only need to make sure that we're concerned about what their beliefs are, but why they have those beliefs. We can strengthen their convictions by giving them evidence. And so we do, we give them God's word. And then, as Aaron said, we also give them God's world. Oh, I thought you were going to go. (laughs) Now, and, and actually on that too, I mean, being male-bodied, female-bodied um, is, is obviously something we want to talk about with our kids. And, and again, it, it's so much deeper than just body parts. Being male-bodied and female body is in our DNA. It has to do with testosterone and estrogen. Our skeletal structures are different. Our bone density is different. Our muscle mass is different. We have brain differences, and there are benefits to these differences, and there's beauty to these differences. And that's what with those middle school girls I was trying to unpack with them. Just because I was saying the male body in in general is bigger and stronger didn't mean that there weren't benefits and beauty also to the female body and how that was built. So here's a, here's a video of a young person um, that we think shows the problem with if we don't even elevate the beauty of the human body with our kids, they can be swept up in this cultural wave of really demeaning the human body. Watch this. The single most common question I get asked is, are you a boy or are you a girl? The simple answer is no. But then the response after that is usually a very confused, what? So here is the explanation. I am non-binary and that means I identify as something other than male or female. Our society and history has led us to believe over thousands of years that there are only people who are male and people who are female. But that is because past society has based gender on physical sex. Let me see what it is, nurse. (laughs) Ah, yes, what a strapping young lad. (laughs) It's outdated. The truth is that gender is in the brain, and physical sex is a completely separate and different thing that is private to every individual. What people really mean when they're asking the boy or girl question is creepily, So, what genitals do you have? People need to realize it doesn't matter what living meat skeleton you've been born in, it's what you feel that defines you. Non-binary is a blanket term for anyone who identifies out with the binary gender. There are endless ways of being non-binary and no two people identify in the same way. So just remember, gender is what you feel, not what your parts are. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Bye guys. Okay, that's a video that's aimed at young people, right? And they find it very compelling. So we're going to have to help them think through this. And part of thinking through this is, is helping to elevate a, and have a biblical view of male bodies and female bodies and how wonderful, wonderful they are. And I notice just a few things of what, what uh, she says in this video, right? She, she tries to make a distinction that, well, sex is physical, but gender is in the brain. But what's the brain? The brain is physical. 
So it's still physical all the way around. See, this is where you gotta, you, we've got to point out for our young people the inherent contradictions in these kind of views. Number two, think about the way that the body is talked about. In, in particular, we've, she reduces sex to what? Genit genitals, right? So reduce sex to genitals and then say, wow, that's kind of creepy that you're asking, what are my genitals? Okay, it is, is, so what you have actually is a, um, a degraded view of the human body, right? A degraded view of the genitals, that these are insignificant. What's a biblical worldview say? No, those are very significant parts of the body, the human body. In fact, it goes all the way back to Genesis 1. What is the first command that God gives people? Be fruitful and multiply. And that requires certain body parts. So God elevates those things. My goodness, we in the church should be the first ones to talk to our kids about anatomy. Because when we do that, we can show the beauty of God's design. If you haven't talked to your kids by the time they're in middle school, about sex and anatomy, uh, you need to. And we have been far too uh, willing to concede that conversation because it gets uncomfortable. Let's get comfortable with it because it's ours. It's, God, it's the Lord's. His, it's his domain. And then notice the third thing that she said. It doesn't matter what living meat skeleton you're born in. Again, what's she doing? Degrading the body. Right? You hear hints of Gnosticism here. Mm -hmm. You degrade the body. And so what we're doing is we, in gender, transgender ideology, we are normalizing estrangement from and devaluation of our bodies. And that is not only unbiblical, it's unhealthy. And so what do we do? We teach young people, that our bodies are a result of God's good design. In fact, this is why you teach anatomy. When you, and this is why we teach sex education as Christian parents, because what you can do is you can show the design of the genitals, how God has created them so beautifully for one another to do what? To produce the next generation. And at the same time, provide wonderful pleasure and intimacy between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, right? This is how we need to talk about these things and teach that our bodies are a result of God's good design and not shy away from these things. Otherwise, if you don't teach your kids on this, the culture will. It already is. It already is. Most parents aren't even aware how much their kids already know, okay? And of course, gender, as we said, is is much more than just our physical body parts. It, it turns out God's design for us and how he designed our body matches up with also how we are as male and female. And this is, again, truth we can find in the scripture, but it's also truth we can find in God's world. And social scientists have studied human beings for as long as they can in all different times and civilizations, and they find patterns in males and females that go across time and culture. And so we wanted to highlight just a few that show, again, the beauty of God's design. So with, with males, um, what they have found that in general, the male nature is a builder. And the female nature tends more to be a nurturer. And you see how both of these actually reflect um, the image of God. That Genesis 126, building, creating, and the relational, the us, let us, let us create. I think the builder nurturer is just, again, one of these self-evident thing. If you've never helped out in your church's two and three-year-old Sunday class, I, a Sunday school class, I highly recommend it. I've taught Sunday school for little ones for a long time. In general, the boys are building and building things up, destroying them. And in general, the girls are pleasant with one another. They don't typically poke or bug one another. They're typically very nurturing and tend towards nurturing activities. 
in general. Another thing that um, social scientists have found about male and female, again, cross-culture, cross-time, is that males tend towards risk behavior and that females tend towards security. Um, if you think about it, in a family, who generally initiates taking a new job or moving to a new area? Taking risks with the whole family. I mean, why are car insurance premiums higher for male high school boys? Insurance companies, <laughs> what'd you say? Sexism. Sexism, exactly. I mean, insurance companies don't care about any of this stuff. They're about the, the bottom line, right? And they know who are the riskiest drivers to insure. Teenage boys. So we know this. Uh, another difference about males and females is that men tend towards competition to compete and females tend towards connection. Not that, and again, it's not that females never risk or compete or do these things and that men are never about the other things. It's in general what the genders tend towards. And we, we discovered this even recently when COVID happened and the world shut down and all of a sudden we're all home together. Our family is like, well, let's start a, a tournament for Settlers of Catan. It's a board game that we all like. Anybody so, play Settlers? No. Any, any nerds out there <laughs> like us? Okay, 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 our family loves it and we're all at home and, you know, it's good for all the different ages of our kids. So we start this tournament. And it quickly becomes a lot of times frustrating for me because fights are breaking out and I'm thinking this tournament was a really bad decision. He's loving it. And I'm walking away frustrated. And then at one point, you know, we're kind of, we're kind of arguing. I'm like, everyone's just so mean to each other when we play these games. And he's like, it's awesome. You know, the kids are competing. They're real. And I'm like, well, but it, the point is for us to connect and like spend time together. And I walk away hating all of you, you know, <laughs> and he's like, oh, you see this as connection time? And I'm like, don't you? And he's like, no, I'm trying to beat the kids. I want to win the tournament. The purpose you know? of playing a game is to win, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, just a good in general example of how we are different and even how our bodies match so well with how we are wired differently. We'll give you an example of really a self-evident difference between males and females. Here is a prayer that one of our children gave when they were three years old. And we'll re this is an actual prayer that we wrote down. And you can guess we have two boys and three girls. So you guess which one, either one of our girls or one of our boys. Dear Lord, give the superheroes strength in the movies and for our family to be strong, to punch the bad guys and the trolls. I have no idea where that came from. And for us to get an ax. Amen. That was prayed at our dinner table. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> so can you guess if it was one of our daughters or one of our sons who prayed a prayer like that? It's obviously, <laughs> obviously our son Jonah, when he was three years old, uh, prayed this prayer. And you, were you going to say something? No, no, go ahead. Okay, well, we probably need to skip that. We have a... Okay, we're gonna, yeah, we, we, we've got a, a video clip that kind of plays us out a little bit more, some of the generalities, because what we're pointing to are generalities. Mm -hmm. And so here's, your, here's some homework for fun homework. Go to YouTube, uh, do a search for Tim Hawkins. If you know who Tim Hawkins is, he's a Christian comedian. Uh, and type in Tim Hawkins, girls versus boys. And he's got a hilarious bit on the difference between girls and boys. But we're going to slip, skip to the slide that is uh, generalities and stereotypes. Because what we're appealing to are generalities. Okay? Because I, I know that a lot of people, when you talk, appeal to ge generalities, they're going to say, well, well, but, 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 but. Right? Mm -hmm. And yes, absolutely. Generalities can be good, and they can help us to create categories, right, that help us organize the world. But we realize they're generalities. Now, sometimes what happens is those generalities get reduced to stereotypes. 
And that's what we don't want to slip into is simply uh, stereotyping people that does not allow for appropriate variation from the general truth. That's why we call them generalities, right? Because it doesn't apply to everybody. It's a general truth. But notice you can only have a stereotype if you have a generality. Stereotypes are rooted in a good generality. A negative stereotype is rooted in a good generality. So, for instance, when it comes to boys, it's a general statement, right, that boys are more rough and tumble, but a generality does not mean that all boys are going to engage in gender-typical activities and that no girls will ever engage in those activity, activities, right? That, it's a generality. There are exceptions. And we need to understand this and not reduce gender to a, a kind of a rigid view that, well, if you're a boy, well, you like to hunt then, right? And you like to play sports, and you like to wrestle and fight. I mean, if you're a boy, it's okay if you don't like video games. It's okay if you don't like football. It's okay if you don't like blowing things up, <laughs> right? If you're a boy, you're allowed to prefer art. If you're a boy, you're allowed to prefer ballet. You're allowed to pl prefer playing an instrument, okay? Uh, if you're a guy and you like playing a musical instrument, if you're a guy and you like art, guess what? You're still a guy. You're just a guy that likes art. You are not a girl. Yeah, and same with girls. I mean, we have all these stereotypes, right? If you're a girl, you like shopping and chick flicks and makeup, and you're not allowed to prefer sports or working on cars or going fishing. You know, we can sometimes slip into these. Now, when I was little, I was a tomboy growing up. Now, that term tomboy is completely gone now. But when I was little, that's what I was. I, I had three sisters. They all played with dolls. They liked dresses. And, and I preferred to play outside with the boys in the neighborhood. I asked for drum sets and footballs for Christmas. And, and thankfully, I grew up with parents who didn't treat me like something was wrong with me. It was, oh, Erin's a girl that likes different things than her sister. And, and that wasn't a big deal. And so if you're a girl and you like watching football, that's great. You're a girl that likes watching football. You'll mostly have to sit with the boys while you watch the football game, but that's okay. You're still a girl. Good news. Uh, all right. We want to point you to some resources, mm -hmm. and then we want to deal with one last thing here. I think it's going to be really helpful. Number one, uh, we've got a few resources at the table back there. The book that John and I wrote, both in the parent guide, the adult guide, and the student guide, has a whole chapter on gender identity and also deals with other LGBT issues and deals with broader worldview and culture. This book, these, these books are going to give you some real practical advice on how to help you equip your kids with a Christian worldview. Uh, there's another book that we don't have back there, but that really spells out in very helpful ways the differences between males and females. It's a book by Glenn Stanton called Secure Daughters, Confident Sons. Read that book. It'll really help lay out some more definition. Mm -hmm. And then Erin, I want to promote Erin's work. She does this incredible podcast with Sarah Stone Street called the Strong Women Podcast. And don't be deceived by the name. It's, it's not just for women. We get, uh, she gets all kinds of feedback from men who love listening to it with their wives. It's, it's about God's design for women. And there are two episodes in particular that relate to these issues that we're talking about. And so I would encourage you, get on your podcast app, listen to these episodes in particular to get resourced on this. Episode number 31 is entitled, Our Bodies Proclaim the Gospel with Christopher West. And what it will help you do is develop a theology of the body. Evangelical, American evangelicals in the U.S., almost none of them have any theology of the body. Go ask them. Tomorrow morning at church, just go, hey, what's your theology of the body? <laughs> They're going to say, well, what, do you, what, what do you mean? Like, what does Scripture tell us? What, is, what does the Christian worldview tell us about the body? And if we can't answer that question, how are we going to be able to pass that on to our kids? We don't have that knowledge to pass on to our kids. So we've got to figure out, what does Scripture teach about the body? Listen to this podcast. It is 
I don't know, maybe my favorite of all the ones that they've done. And then secondly, listen to podcast episode number 50, which is entitled Beyond Pink and Blue, and that's with Glenn Stanton, the author of that book, okay? All right, so there's a, a lot of good resources out there. I'll give you a couple more, but I want you to, to, to think about this last lie. Here's the last lie that the culture gives. It's that there is a gender spectrum. Right? This is what young people are being told. There's a gender spectrum. So you've got male on one side, female on the other, and then you can choose between 50, 75, 100. There's an infinite amount of genders. And always in a lie, you'll find a partial truth. Here's the partial truth. There is a spectrum. But the spectrum isn't male all the way to female and everything in between. There is a spectrum. There's a spectrum of maleness, and there's a spectrum of femaleness. That's where the spectrum goes, but there's a ceiling. And so you have a boy, right? And on that boy, there's a spectrum with boys, isn't there? You have the more sensitive boys, all the way to what we call the rough and tumble boys, and everything in between. And some of us, we've got real sensitive boys. And some of us, maybe all we got is the rough and tumble kind. And we wish we had some more sensitive boys, right? <laughs> but no matter where they are on that spectrum, they're always boys. And this is where very practically, dads in particular, we gotta be careful what we say to our boys, especially our sensitive boys, who need three A's, right? Attention affirmation, and affection. And if we don't give that to those sensitive boys, then they won't, they won't connect with their maleness in the appropriate ways. Then you've got girls. And guess what? As Aaron mentioned, you got the girly girls, right, who love all the frilly stuff, all the way to the tomboys who like to get dirty, you know, maybe with the boys. And everything in between. And guess what? The spectrum doesn't mean she goes from femaleness to become a male. No, it's female all along that spectrum. She's still a girl. That's the truth, is the spectrum is in maleness and femaleness, and it doesn't cross over that. So here's what you and I need to do. We need to become experts for our kids on this topic. Number one, by knowing the Christian worldview and communicating it, not just the what, but also the why. But then you need to become the expert on this particular issue. Now, that doesn't mean you need to go get your PhD, okay? And I know maybe you feel a little bit of stress on that. I want you to feel an appropriate amount of discomfort because that can be motivating. Because, but I want your kids to come to you as a parent, to you as a grandparent, to you as a youth worker, to you as a, a Sunday school teacher or whatever. They want them to come to you because they know, gosh, okay, they, they, grandma knows her stuff on this. And she's an authority, and so I can ask her questions. And she's not going to berate me, and she's, she's going to listen, but then she's got something to say. Well, to have something to say, guess what? You've got to do a little bit of homework. Are our kids worth it to put that kind of effort in? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so two books that are must-reads on this. Number one, Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier, who is not a Christian. She would identify herself on the political left. And she looked into this issue and has been blown away and wrote this book that tells you about the damage that's being done to our girls. Yeah, so I just want to say specifically about this book is if you have a daughter or girls in your life at all, you need to read this book yeah. because it talks specifically about, about why the transgender movements target, and I don't mean just the transgender student in your middle school. I mean the movement, its target is on young girls. And if that doesn't make sense to you, like, for example, I don't know if you know, but 70% of transgender surgeries are performed on girls. Why 70%? The book answers the question. I'd love to talk more about that, but it's important to think about specifically um, why, as women and young girls, we need to be aware of the messages coming from this movement. Yeah, and if you want more on the biology and some of the physical makeup, mm -hmm. also on some of the psychology and some of the mental stuff, uh, get Ryan Anderson's book, When Harry Became Sally. And just so you know, you can't get that one on Amazon. Amazon banned that one. So you got to find some other source for that. But that is a great book, well-researched, dealing with the scientific stuff. Uh, also, I would encourage you, Aaron and I do a parent podcast. We have done probably seven or so, eight 
episodes on gender and, uh, you know, kind of talking, uh, in, engaging with the culture on this, talking to your kids about this. I would encourage you, if you're a parent or a grandparent uh, or, or other, in other parts uh, of, you know, the church or school or whatever where you're influencing young people, uh, listen to the podcast. I, I think it'll be a, a resource for you on these kind of things. Okay, let me close uh, with this. You know, we talk about, uh, you know, needing to love anybody from the LGBTQ uh, community, right? And that is absolutely true. We need to love them well. But often, as we've been talking with parents whose kids are struggling with these things or they've got friends or family members, what we hear is, yeah, we just, we just need to love them. And that's as deep as it goes. We've got to stop simply saying we need to love them and we need to define what love actually looks like. Because the culture has a view of love, right? What's the culture's view of love? Affirm. Affirm and accept, and that's it. Well, what's a biblical view of love? A biblical view of love, 1 John 3, 18, let us love with word, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we don't just say, oh, we love you and we just act kind, but there are actions and what else? Truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter. What does it do? What does it say? Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Imagine if Aaron and I had this view of love. Like, for her to love me meant that she had to affirm everything I did. <laughs> How do you think that's going to work out? I've never said those words. Yeah. Thank you. Because you <laughs> love me. Because love requires much more than just affirmation. Sometimes it's very affirming. Sometimes love feels wonderful and it's warm and we're gracious and we're kind and we're tender. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I want to, if my neighbor comes out to me and says they're transitioning, there's going to be a lot of kindness and a lot of love and a lot of trying to walk with them over time. And at the same time, because I love them, I also must at some point bear witness to the truth and not simply go along with their lies. Why? Because I love them, and I know that if you live by lies, it will bring harm into your life. Here's how C.S. Lewis defined it. He said, love is not just affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. We need much deeper views of what it means to love in this culture. And loving the way that Scripture loves, loving the way that Jesus loves, doesn't mean everyone's then going to embrace us. Because Jesus said it himself in John 15, if the world hates you, guess what? It hated me first. Well, who was the most loving man who ever walked the earth? It was Jesus. And so we don't measure our success of loving the world based on the world's response. Because loving people requires the truth, and the world hates the truth. And so we've got to be courageous enough to love like Jesus loved. And to do the hard things. And to say the hard things with grace and love and gentleness and all that, but never compromising the truth. Maven exists to help the next generation know truth, pursue goodness, and create beauty for the cause of Christ. To find out more, check out maventruth.com.